uh, Rush Limbaugh. He's trying to buy the Rams. Uh, we've been telling you about this for a little while now, and he's part of this group uh, that is interested in buying uh, the St. Louis Rams because they're in disastrous shape and they're looking to sell it. And he's from Missouri, so it makes some degree of sense. And we have kind of mixed feelings about that. Uh, it is America. You're allowed to say uh, different things. I'm not sure they should hold that against them. But uh, my opinion is not as relevant here because uh, apparently a lot of people feel that it should be held against them, that there are bounds of reason to what an owner can say, uh, put as, putting aside whatever they think, right? And uh, look, and owners have a variety of opinions, and some of them I'm sure are heinous, and people don't want to get too much into the politics, but when you have a very public figure who are saying a number of controversial things that people find to be racist, well, then you've got an issue, uh, because a large percentage of the NFL uh, is, uh, first of all, African American, and then second of all, um, a large percentage of the NFL doesn't like racist, whether they're African Americans or not, right? Including, apparently, ownership. And that's where the real problem is. Now, we've told you in the past, a couple of p players came out and said, under no condition would I play for Rush Limbaugh. Uh, a player on the Giants said, uh, I have principles and I would never uh, play for his team. Bart Scott from the linebacker, uh, linebacker for the Jets came out and said, uh, again, under no circumstances would I play for a team owned by Rush Limbaugh. Then the NFL Players Association, uh, one of their representatives came out and said, this is a bad idea, we shouldn't go in that direction. And now some of the owners are speaking out. Jim Ursay uh, from the Colts said, I would not be in favor of voting for him. It's a direct quote. He said, I could ask Tony Dungy, Jim Caldwell, Dwight Freeney, and consult with them, but there have been comments that have been made that have been inappropriate, incendiary, and insensitive. It's bigger than football. We have to watch the, word, the words that, that we say. Sometimes privileges in life do get lost. I would not feel comfortable. So now Roger Goodell, the commissioner, coming out going, mm, I don't think so. Okay. Now, he hasn't fully said no, but that is obviously what's happened behind the scenes. Now, there's a twist in the story, which we're going to get to in a second. Okay. But first, uh, to give you a sense of the pressure that's being put on and why it's being put on, Brave New Films did a short little video here that has some of Rush Limbaugh's choice quotes that Jim Irsay is referring to. So let's watch that one first. I just want to make sure I have this straight. Turns out I am the racist. He once declared that slavery built the South. I'm not saying we should bring it back. I'm just saying it had its merits. For one thing, the streets were safer after dark. Ooh, ah, bullseye! In a league that is 70% African American, the NFL cannot have an owner with a history of statements that to put it bluntly, are stone-cold racist. The NFL all too often looks like a game between the Bloods and the Crips without any weapons. There, I said it. Black NFL players will boycott playing the game if I am an owner in the league. From Obama's America, the white kids now get beat up with the black kids cheering, yeah, right on, right on, right on, right on. He's going to take from the rich. He's going to take them. He's going to give it to you. The media has been very desirous that a black quarterback do well. I said exactly what I meant, and if you want me to, I'll say it again. Here you have a racist. And by the way, that's only about half the quotes. There's, of course, the famous quote when he told uh, African-American caller to take the bone out of his nose. Uh, there was uh, when he uh, stood up for the white government in South Africa uh, and uh, back when there was apartheid. Not, he didn't say it at the time, he said it later about, oh yeah, these Democrats were against the apartheid government in South Africa. Yeah, they were. And he made very derogatory comments about Nelson Mandela, who's only a worldwide hero, right? So, I mean, you get a sense of where Rush Limbaugh is going with this stuff. And he says he's sticking to his guns and that he's not going to back down. In fact, he said on his show, I'm not even thinking of exiting. I'm not even thinking of caving. I'm not a caver. None of us are. We've been betrayed too many times by people who have caved. Uh, and then he talks and compares himself to a pioneer and how he's taking arrows for being a pioneer. Is that right, Rush? Uh, now we've got a little bit of caving going on. But I've got to tell you why. Now, we're going to play you some Rush clips uh, from today. Uh, because the guy putting this together is Dave Checkets, uh, chairman of the St. Uh, Louis Blues, which is a hockey team, right? And Rush was going to be a minority owner. There's now reports out that they're telling Rush, sad day, big guy, but you got to take the bullet on this one. Uh, we're not going to go forward with you. Oh, oh, that hurts. Oh, that stings. 
Oh. All right, first, let's listen to uh, clip number five about him crying about how the bid has fallen apart. Lisa, Prairie Home, Missouri. Welcome to the EIB Network. Hi. Hello, Rush. Hi. What an honor. Thank you very much. I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. Does the government play any role in whether you purchase the St. Louis Rams team or not? Well, they're trying to. Uh, members of the government are. Sheila Jackson Lee certainly is trying to. Well, that's... They're, 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 they're trying to... Intim Look, let, let, let's, let's cut to the chase here, folks. Now, Lisa, hang on. Let, let, let's cut to the chase here. I can think of no liberal, no matter how foul-mouthed, no matter how hateful, in entertainment or outside entertainment, who would be banned from being part of an NFL ownership group. I can't think of one liberal, inside or outside entertainment, foul-mouthed, can't think of one liberal who would even be treated like this. This is all about smearing mainstream traditional conservatism, and I, El Rushbo, happen to be the most prominent voice for mainstream traditional conservatism. They cannot beat us, folks, in the arena of ideas. For my entire 21-year broadcast career, they have attempted to discredit me and everybody else who is prominent in conservatism. And it's now descended to the point that they have to make up things, I said. And then when we catch them making up things, they say, well, so what? He really believes them. He really believes the words we put in his mouth. We know he believes them. We know who he is. There are people, no liberal would ever be treated like this. Oh. No matter how foul-mouthed. I mean, there are rappers that own parts of NBA teams. Lyrics to their songs we couldn't play on this radio show. They're celebrated. Cool, Daddy, cool. What is that? What is that cool, Daddy, cool? What is this, 1920s? Hey, Daddy-o. I mean, notice whenever he does the black thing, he did it at the end of the Brave New Films clip, too, where he says something weird where he thinks that's, I guess, how black folks talk, right? Cool, Daddy, cool. It was right on. Right, right on. on, right on. Right, that's it. What am I going to do with this dude, right? Uh, so, and JR forgot to play you the other segment of the Rush Limbo show where he, it was just basically this. <laughs> no liberal would get treated this way. Why are they treating me like this? You know, r rappers, even rappers, you know how they are. They get to own teams. Why don't I? <laughs> I love the way he says people make things up. We have the audio tape. We just played you some of it. On this show, we've played you clips over and over. Part of the reason we play the clips is because then they say, oh, yeah, they made it up. No, we, all we do is we take what you said and we play it. That's it. It speaks for itself. Every quote, except the, the nose in, in the ring was before everybody was recording all of Rush Limbaugh's shows, right? With the exception of that, but it's, he doesn't deny that quote. Uh, every other one is on tape. So, sad day for Rush. Now, it really is a sad day for him, because remember he said, I'm not backing down, I'm not a caver, right? Well, he must have gotten word from Dave Checkets, this thing is not going well, and there's a certain bus that's got your name under it, and you're going to have to go ahead and check that out as we throw you under the bus, right? So now, listen to how depressed he sounds in this next clip. And I thought he didn't backpedal, but this... This sounds a bit like a backpedal, Rush. Let's listen. I have said something that they are taking out of context. I did say, but they're not putting it in kind of Bloods and Crips kind of. I mean, I can explain that. Um, but look, nobody is clean and pure as the wind-driven snow. And everybody gets second chances. And people pay the price. when They pay their debt. Uh, if they are convicted of something, uh, you wipe the slate clean. Yeah, I, every, everybody, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't have any desire to, to deny people second chances and that kind of thing. The, 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 look, and those are the kind of things I can't discuss. But let me take the occasion of your call to explain the Bloods and Crips comment because uh, these guys who are now admitting, okay, maybe we can't source those quotes about Limbaugh and uh, James Earl Ray and slavery, but he said Bloods and Crips. He said Bloods and Crips. They're trying to get anything else to continue the narrative here that I am some subhuman species with no rights. 
to exist anywhere outside this radio studio and within these radio waves. I believe the comments from 2007, and I believe the comments were made after I got, I got a, to a phone call. I had a phone call on the, I think, to a phone, I'd have to check the transcript of that date, which I've not done. But my memory is it was a playoff game in San Diego between the Chargers and the Patriots. And the Patriots had a fourth down with many, a very few seconds left in the game. Fourth and, and ball game. And the Chargers held them. Chargers win. Chargers are leading. Then all of a sudden, the ref throws a flag. Fifteen yards or something for taunting, unsportsmanlike conduct. Some Chargers DB had gotten in the face of some Patriots player was doing a you-can't-diss-me act and so forth. And it lost the game for the Chargers. And I said, you know, I, I praised the official for throwing the flags. I love the game. But the NFL wants to keep control of the game. It's the product on the field. And they cannot allow the tendency, the, 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 the integrity of the game to be blown up by whatever cultural trends are going on. So the like Bloods and Crips comment, I think I said, sometimes the game looks like Bloods and Crips without the weapons. Now, we had Mercury Morris, who was, I guess, on CNN a couple days ago, say, I know what he's talking about, and he's right. I know exactly what he's talking about. Mercury Morris played for the Dolphins uh, back in the, uh, in the Don Shula era. My, uh, my comment could easily be taken as criticism of players. What it was, was it, well, it was criticism of that kind of, it was totally unnecessary, lost a ball game. Lost a ball game, all for the purpose of, of strutting around. The, the, it's, it's, and, it, and, and what it was, folks, was criticism of a mindset. That comment was more of a, oh, no, geez, don't let it, don't, don't, don't let this happen. To the game, I love you, I, you, you don't want to see brawls on the, you don't, you don't want to, just don't, I don't want to see it. I, I, I have the game on a pedestal. I have the people who play it on a pedestal. And I just, I, I don't want that to change. So I was criticizing a mindset that is destructive, and it was not helpful. It was not racial. Bloods and Crips makes it look racial, but the way I chose to describe it, I could have perhaps chosen a different term. Well, I, Rush, I thought you weren't going to cave. I thought you were going to stand. You know, you saw that clip at the end. He says, you want me to repeat it? I'll stand by everything I say. You know what? It happened. In the middle of that clip, for the first time, I felt a little bad for Rush Limbaugh. And remember, look, this guy's gotten married and divorced many times. He lives this lonely existence down in South Florida. Uh, he's a drug addict. Uh, at best, he's struggling to not fall off the wagon. At worst, God knows what he's doing. But he was an enormous drug addict before. Uh, and he's this kind of sad, lonely guy. And he's got a lot of braggadocio, and he does that on the show. And he makes a ton of money, don't get me wrong. And so you shouldn't feel too bad for him. Uh, but uh, he doesn't seem to have a lot of friends, and then here he really, and I believe him that he definitely loves football, right? And he probably had his hopes up real high, and then it looks like he got the word that it's not going to work out, and now he's trying to, for the first time in his life, backpedal, 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 backpedal. And, you know, Rush, that's why sometimes, sometimes people do it, because things have consequences, and if you really didn't intend something some way, you're, you have to say it, right? And there's no harm in it, except he's built his career on saying, no, I'm always going to you know, do this and this and get away with it. But now you didn't get away with it because people said, you know what? It, we find it unacceptable, right? And so you're out of luck. And he just seemed downright sad there. And that's that me being a no good lib that I actually, by the end of it, felt a little bad for. JR. I did not. First of all, I did not send reject you for feeling that way. Number one. <laughs> Agreed. No. Um, the thing is, is yeah, um, he feels bad. He feels, he's down on himself. But this is the thing: just because you feel bad, or um, uh, you know, or you have a problem with what happened, it means he's human. Racists are human. That's fine. I, you to figure he feel bad. The the thing that was surprising about him feeling bad and actually saying it like that was that this is the first time he's realized that he can't do anything he wants. He's not all-powerful. 
he, which is why he's upset, I think, at President Obama because he's like, this guy has too much power. He likes the power he has. And he likes the way he can talk to people and get them to do whatever the hell he wants. So he, he finally said, wait, 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 you mean, you mean I, I, I can't do what I want? This is something that really is important to him. It's obvious that he loves football. It really is important to him. It, as we've always said, if you were uber rich, what would you want to do? And a lot of guys say, oh, own a sports team. That's, I'd be sitting in the stands. I'd be Mark Cuban every day. Calling out refs calls. Who cares? I'll give you $25,000 since I called you out. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a dream. Now, the fact that that's so important to him, and he can't do it without someone allowing him, letting him in the club, now he's, like, helpless. He's defend- He's like, I can't talk my way into this. So now he has nothing else to do but to backpedal. But just because you're a racist doesn't mean that, you know, that it's all right now. He doesn't realize. Most racists don't know they're racist. Just because he, I believe him when he says, I'm not racist, that had had no basis in racism. Most racists don't know that they're racist. They think they're perfectly fine people. They just don't understand that they have a lower thought process of other people that aren't like them. Now, it's, there's a couple points he does. Murky Morris. Murky Morris said, I understand exactly what he's saying. That's another one of those things. Well, a black guy agrees with me, so it can't be. They don't realize that's a telltale sign, number one. And he's, he's not saying it in a malicious way. Just because he's not being malicious doesn't mean it's not a racist statement. Um, and um, uh, the other part of what he said. Um, oh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, l- let me jump in here for a couple of things. I-, I agree with you, Chair. D- don't get me wrong. I'm not going soft on Rush, right, in, in the sense that uh, some of those comments are indisputably racist. We've talked about it on the show before. And, what he, and, and I agree with you that he doesn't get it. Like, that's why he thinks, I don't. I'm not a racist. Why do they keep saying it? But every time he talks about black people on his show, or nearly every time, he puts them down. He shows the uneducated person in Detroit, right, and says, this is your typical Obama voter, and he tries to make black people look dumb. And then he gets joy out of that. He gets money out of that. He has a career out of that, right? And then, but in his mind, well, that's how black people are. I'm not being racist, right? And he says in black uh, America, I'm sorry, in Obama's America, black kids beat up the white kids. How could you not get that that's racial? Of course it's racial, right? But he doesn't get it because it's so ingrained in him. And he thinks, well, racists are bad people, probably. I hope he thinks that. And since I think I'm a good person, well, I can't be racist, is my guess as how, as how, to, as how he feels. But, J.R., you really nailed it there. This is the first time that his offensive words have had consequences for him. They've had consequences for other people, right? But never for him. Every time he said him, he just got richer and richer. And so now that somebody says, hey, you know what? You don't get everything you want. And in this case, you're not going to get to partake in this, in the NFL and participate in the NFL because people find you really offensive. They think you're a really bad guy. And they don't want to, they literally don't want to play with you. And I think all of that comes crashing down on him. His sense of loss of power, uh, but at the same time, what I was talking about in the beginning, this alienation and how he always felt like he was left out, that he was a loser kid with no friends, right? And again, people don't want to play with him. And so that's why he seems, in my mind, uh, totally depressed as he's doing that first ever backpedal in his life. Yeah, because the part of that that I cut out, he went to a longer, several minute um, tangent about how he said, everybody wants to be, have their dream. You know, kids grow up wanting to be a pro athlete. He said, and you have to understand your limits. I can never do it. You want to be as close to it as possible. Well, he was talking about how much he really wanted to do it because he never could be that. He said, I would love to have been out there every Sunday playing, da, 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 and I can't now. It never could. And he admitted that. Of course, the majority of people can't do it. That's why it's such an amazing thing we love seeing. So he really put in how much he loves it and that he can't do it now. But the thing is, racism isn't always just um, knowingly going, I'm going to go pick out this, this, and that, and I hate you, and I hate you. And this it's ignorance. It's just ignorance. And ignorance isn't always you're stupid. It just means you don't understand. You don't know anything about the people you're talking about. You have assumptions about them. And you put them wherever they may be. Wherever you got the influence, I don't know how he grew up or who was talking to him. But he's, he's been influenced by certain aspects or maybe experiences in life. And he, he paints it as the entire picture. So sometimes if somebody's called a racist, it doesn't always mean that they're the devil. It means that their, uh, their thoughts and their beliefs are wrong. And maybe... In order for somebody to listen, especially as powerful and rich as this guy is, in order for somebody to listen for five seconds, they have to be hit in their heart. And nobody could ever find this dude's heart, and this might be part of it. So I don't expect a conversation to be had with Rush Limbaugh all of a sudden. But maybe that's the way for certain people. They can be like, and they start looking at it differently and go, wow, really? 
And he never had to do that because he didn't care. Right, and I think what happened there was the other uh, people that were interested in, in doing this bid for the Rams that he was partnering out with said, hey, Rush, you see how the blood and Crips thing looks like it's racial? And for the first time, he had to go, since there's something on the line for him, sit back and go, oh, I guess so, right? And that's what he was doing in that clip. And, and it's a whole new world for him. <laughs> so, I mean, if something... If anything positive has come out of this, maybe it's that, that maybe he actually looked at those comments for the first time and saw it from somebody else's perspective, because in this case, he was forced to, right? Now, don't get carried away, and don't think I'm getting carried away. Rush will come back tomorrow and be just as incendiary, and he'll come back and pre pretend to be, oh, yeah, I never care, oh, yeah, who cares? Because that's it, he's not getting it. Roger Goodell doesn't come out and speak it against it if he's going to get it. No way. He's done. He's not getting the ramps, right? So then he'll strike back, and he'll be angry, and he'll pretend he never backpedaled, et cetera, et cetera. But don't be fooled by that. He was a hurt little kid there. He was. Cannot play with him. Cannot win with him. Cannot coach with him. Can't do it. Singletary gets the last word.